Welcome to Biz Help For You with host Candy Messer. Entrepreneurs like to focus on the big picture, like profitability, success, and a smooth running organization. There always seems to be those little things like taxes, employee compensation, laws, regulations, and more. Now, you can get the answers you need in one place. Join us today as we break it all down for you. Now, here is your host, Candy Messer. Hello and welcome to Bids Help For You with Candy Messer. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you found the information on last week's show answering questions about freelance work informative. If you are unable to join us and would like to listen to the show, links can be found on our YouTube and Facebook pages, as well as links for iTunes, TuneIn, iHeartRadio, Spotify, and Stitcher. If there are topics you'd find beneficial or questions you have, please feel free to reach out to me at media at abandp.com. Now let's learn a little bit about our guest today. For 25 years, Dan Eds has been a practicing management consultant working primarily with state and local governments, healthcare, K-12 education, higher education, and nonprofits. He's the author of two books, the first, Transformation Management, and his most recent book, Leveraging the Genetics of Leadership, Cracking the Code of Sustainable Team Performance. His latest book looks at how elite organizations approach the practice of leadership. The results are organizations that drive unparalleled customer value, daily innovation, and unmatched levels of employee engagement. So Dan, welcome to the show. Uh, Thank you. It's great to be with you. So my first question always is just to tell us a little bit more about yourself, because I read a little tiny bit of a bio, but it's always interesting to hear more about where someone has come from and how they actually got into the industry that they're in. So I'd love you to tell a little bit more about yourself. Sure. Well, um, I didn't go to school to be a management consultant, (laughs) and uh, (laughs) it it sort of found me. Um, Actually, a, a friend of mine called me one evening and said, um, I have this, uh, he, was, he was the business manager of a fairly large school district. And um, he said, I have this in-plant print shop. I don't, know, I don't know what to do with it. And I was in the graphic arts business at the time. And um, I had finished my MBA about a year and a half before and on the kind of a downturn in the economy. I couldn't, couldn't even buy an interview, let alone a job. Yeah. And, and um so uh, I went and visited with him in his office. I didn't. I had no clue what he what I what he wanted. I didn't know if he was looking for if, you know if he wanted me to apply for a job or what. Mm-hmm. I finally figured out what he wanted was a uh, was an, a consulting engagement. And so, um, no joke, I quoted him twice what I thought he'd be willing to pay, and he paid it. So <laughs> that, <laughs> that's that launched, always a blessing. <laughs> yeah, that launched me into the consulting gig, and that led from one thing to another thing to another thing and to another thing. And then um, uh, about four years ago, <clears throat> um, I was doing a lot of uh, work with lean process perfor- performance, um, organizational performance, um, financial performance. And uh, I had a couple of experiences that really got me to, you know, sort of one of these like aha moments where I thought, what else? There's something else going on here than just process improvement and, and uh, organizational performance. And one of those <clears throat> was um, with a large state agency. Um, Annually, this agency licensed and regulated 450,000 healthcare providers, and um, they were a certifiable mess. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, at every level, they were they were a mess. Just one indication: they knew that their telephone tree was dropping a thousand calls a day. Wow, um, that's crazy. They had, yes, they had, and and they had ten people answering the phone, and on a good day. They had six people answering the phone because everybody hated the job. Mm -hmm. Because as you can imagine, when you did get some, you know, get someone on the line, you people were screaming. Right. And um, uh, so, you know, I spent several months working with them, and um, there was light at the end of the tunnel. Um, It was going to take about eighteen months to actually implement, you know, the the work that we had done. And um, 
I was having my last meeting, kind of a debrief with the, uh, the deputy director. And um, I've got my hand on the door. I'm ready to walk away. My briefcase is in my, my computer case is in my hand. My coat is on. And in almost a tone of confession, she says, you know, I don't even tell my friends where I work anymore. Mm. And I turn around and I said, why not? And she said, it's just too embarrassing. Mm. And that was one of those sort of, um, uh, I wouldn't say crisis moments, but it was one of those pivotal moments for me because I had heard that same kind of sentiment dozens and dozens and dozens of times. Mm. And I, I walked away, I was thinking, you know, that's, there's something criminal, mm. almost criminal, when somebody who dedicates their life for a good, a good, good cause, a good reason, they're skilled, they're talented, they're well-educated, by any measure, they, they should be working in a terrific organization, and they're embarrassed mm -hmm. to tell their friends where they work. So that sort of catapulted me into looking at leadership and how high-performing, high-impact organizations approach the practice of leadership. And um, it's become a bit of an obsession with me the last four years that sometimes I wish I could just sort of like push off and let it go away, but I can't. Mm -hmm. Understood. Well, I know we're going to talk about leadership and, you know, a lot that goes into that as well, but I would love to have your definition first of really what is the culture of servant leadership that we'll be talking about today? Okay. Great question. <laughs> so servant leadership is generally considered a philosophy um, where power is shared and the, there's a focus on developing the workforce. Those are the sort of the two key things, um, uh, empowerment and developing the workforce. Mm -hmm. um, I would argue that um, most people understand servant leadership as a personal style of leadership. Um, in a number of podcasts, people say, well, you know, what style of leadership is the best? It's like, I have no idea. Mm -hmm. Um, because high impact organizations, they don't worry about style. Mm -hmm. um, I, I had um, two interviews uh, with senior officers of the US Army. One was a full colonel. He was 34 year veteran um, within weeks of retirement, a US Army Ranger. Um, the other was a retired four star general who had been in the service for 32 years, uh, a highly, highly decorated um, uh, army officer, went on to serve in a cabinet position in the Clinton administration. I asked both of these guys, how does the army approach leadership? And they both said, we practice servant leadership. Hmm. The subject of personnel style never came up, hmm. nor, mm -hmm. I, nor does I think the army cares. Mm -hmm. um, because they have learned that servant leadership is the best way to accomplish their mission. And then the funny thing was they both used a word I was totally unprepared to hear. And that word was love. Hmm. And um, they spoke about how um, servant leadership was, is like a pathway to a culture of love. Mm -hmm which you, you wouldn't think of a culture of love being right. embedded in the U S mm -hmm. army right. or the Marine Corps or Navy or anything else. But if you, we, if we understand that love doesn't have to be some wishy, wishy sentiment, emotional sentiment, love can actually be a verb. Mm -hmm. And, um, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, the, the general McCaffrey, I, I asked him, I said, how does the army uh, approach the practice of servant leadership? He says, well, let me give you three, three illustrations, three ways. So I'll, I'll, I'll just mention one. He said, um, when a helicopter is leaving to go on a mission and soldiers are boarding that helicopter, he said the highest ranking officer is the last one to get on that helicopter. Mm -hmm. And he said, when the helicopter is landing in a hot war zone with bullets flying, who is the first person to get off that helicopter it's the highest ranking officer mm -hmm. because they are symbolically putting themselves 
and harm's way first. Mm -hmm. So if anybody can give me a better definition of love than that, Hey. Well, I'd welcome hearing it. <laughs> right, exactly. So I read in your bio too that you've written two books, you know, and the one that we're talking about today is, you know, really the topic. So what motivated you to actually write that book about leadership and why is your book different than others that are out there? Great question. And actually, <laughs> I struggled with that question before I ever put, wrote one word because one day I actually did an Amazon search on, on titles on leadership and there was 197,000 titles. Wow, that's a and, lot. <laughs> and I thought, you know, the world doesn't really need another one. And, um, but I wasn't looking at leadership in terms of a personal style, a personal trait. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'd have to say, maybe it might be too much of a stretch, but I'd have to say, Almost every other book on leadership deals with leadership as some kind of a personal trait, personal mm -hmm. style, a set of personal attributes. And the idea is, well, here, here is the, the best set of personal attributes. And if you two can follow these attributes, then you, know, you could be a great leader. Mm -hmm. um, something that has never been proved to be effective, um, something, uh, an approach to leadership that's never proved to work uh, consistently. And so uh, I had this other question, which was, do high impact organizations exhibit any kind of evidence that their approach to leadership is systemic? Meaning there's mm -hmm. a system, there's a mm -hmm. way of doing leadership that's defined from the top all the way to the bottom. Uh, leaders are coached, trained, mentored, and evaluated on their modeling of this of, of their particular kind of leadership and um, lo and behold that is exactly what I found <laughs> high impact organizations do not rely on the goodwill of individual leaders they design a system they coach they train they mentor every leader to the requirements of that system and uh, by the way I wasn't looking for servant leadership but consistently that is exactly what I found hmm. interesting so I would love for you to just talk about the kinds of organizations that you looked at when you did the research for your book and, sure. you know, kind of what you learned sure. from that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I had um, just prior to doing the research, I, I was working with a, a healthcare organization and the CEO had called me into his office one day and he said, um, uh, Dan, I want to I want to design a model of, of leadership so that everybody in this organization uh, understands what that model is and and, um, and how to do it. And uh, of course I've said, well, of, of course I could do that. And I literally walked out the door thinking, now how in the heck am I gonna do this? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but this is, that's what we card carrying consultants do. We figure mm -hmm. we say yes, and then figure out how we're gonna do it later on. Um, but uh, I walked away from that engagement, uh, realizing that it was the most impactful engagement of my career. Mm. In, in fact, uh, the last day I, I was meeting with the senior leadership team after about nine months working with them, a woman who is the chief nursing uh, officer in the organization and by any, by any given measure, uh, personally a terrific leader. Um, she had, uh, you know, she'd started out as a nurse, you know, rose up through the ranks and, um, you know, she was personal for me. She was just personally a delight to work with. Mm -hmm. And after about nine months, we had this model laid out on a wall, you know, big graphics all over the place. And um, we'd identified that the purpose or the focus of their leadership system would be to empower the workforce, empower mm -hmm. their community, because they were a community-based healthcare organization, and empower their patients. And um, uh, we had the whole model laid out on the wall and uh, Melissa looked back just like I am right now, her, sort of her arms folded and she mm -hmm. sat back in her chair and she said, you know, I've always been promoted because I was a good nurse. Mm -hmm. And then they put this title of leader on me. I had no clue what I was supposed to do. She looks at the wall, she points out, she says, now I know what to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is the reaction I've gotten from Every time I've talked about this idea that leadership, 
including servant leadership, can be understood as an organizational system. Invariably, someone will say, you know, I, they, they put this title on me. Mm-hmm. I had no idea what I was supposed to do. Right. Now, I, now I know. Mm-hmm. Well, it's like in any job that you're going to go into, you need to have some kind of guidelines and know, you know, what's supposed to happen and have procedures and processes in place. So I guess people sometimes think, oh, well, you're good. You know, they'll watch you. Oh, you look like you'd be great in this position, right. but then they don't right. know necessarily what the expectations are or how they're supposed to perform their right. duty. Right. So it makes it difficult. Well, and, and unfortunately that is the norm. Mm-hmm. So one of the, one of the first people I interviewed for the book is a young man. He was probably 33 or 34 at the time. Um, he was, he's definitely in the millennial, um, generation and, um, uh, that's exactly what happened to him. He said, he was telling me, he said, you know, I had done, I've done really well. I, I, I know how to manage projects, especially with hydrology. If you want someone to, uh, you know, design and manufacture a hydro or a, uh, hydro a wastewater treatment plant, you know, he's your guy. He could, he could pump them out like crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he's leading his farm in, um, um, uh, using virtual reality and the design and the manufacture of these things. Um, he's, uh, working for one of the world's largest engineering firms. Then they made him a leader. Mm. And, uh, when I was talking to him, I said, so let me guess, he sent you off to a month of leadership development school and uh, his, his, his eyes got big because he, he takes everything serious. And, um, you know, and, and he says, no, they didn't give me anything. <laughs> mm. I said, well, you know, that's the norm, unfortunately is no training and certainly no sense of, of how we want to do leadership in this organization. Mm-hmm. And it's really unfortunate. In fact, I'd, I'd say it's, it's, it's disgustingly unfortunate because it is effectively handing someone the keys to a sailboat mm-hmm. and saying, why don't you sail around the world? And if you, if you make it back, then you're probably a good leader. <laughs> right. And, and, you know, some, some, some never get out of the harbor. Um, you know, some may make it, you know, someplace in the South Pacific where a hurricane hits them or a typhoon, I guess. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, one or two will actually make it back having achieved the objective, but a whole mm-hmm. lot of people are going to drown in the process. Yeah. And the, the cost of that, I think, is catastrophic. Mm-hmm. So when you were going to write your book, how did you determine the organizations that you were even going to research? Yeah, great question. And, um, you know, because I was, I, I had sort of started out with a healthcare mindset, that was kind of where I started. Mm-hmm. And I, I quickly realized, well, um, it's got to be broader than that. So mm-hmm. I, I started out looking or got looking for organizations that had done something remarkably well for a long period of time, uh, which really excluded technology because so many technology firms are, are relatively young. Right. Um, I also excluded looking at financial measures of, per, per, of performance because they're too easy to manipulate market driven, mm. <laughs> you know, every, everything else. Um, and, and besides not too many organizations are really going to open up their, their, you know, their checkbook for you to review. So I ended up looking at things like um, uh, employee engagement, uh, employee mm. safety. Um, uh, I looked at a lot of organizations that practice lean and, um, uh, because a, I, I understood the language, I could talk with them, um, and and organizations like like the military, who's been practicing mm-hmm. outstanding leadership. Not that they do it perfect, but right. they've been, you know, they have been practicing outstanding leadership for a long period of time. Mm-hmm. So that was that was really the key. I wasn't looking for an organization that had done something special for two or three years. Mm-hmm. You know, I was looking for organizations that had done something special for five, 10, 12, 15, 20 years or more or longer. Right. Which means they had to be well known. And in, you know, otherwise, how would you even know to find, you know, them like, oh yeah, they're great at X, Y, Z. So they had to be probably, you know, bigger organizations that have been in the news for positive reasons, you know, over the years. Well, yes, yes and no. Um, Mm -hmm. um, uh, But actually, you know, it was, it was interesting. You know, you, you meet people on airplanes or walking mm. down the street or, you know, okay. at, at a at 4th of July picnic and, and you tell people what you're looking at and they go, Oh, and, uh, and actually this is what happened one time. Uh, this guy says, you know, I'm, he's a marketing guy. He said, you know, I'm working with this organization. Um, 
he said, you know, they haven't raised their prices in 20 years. Oh, wow. And um, so that Very got my unusual. attention. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, and he said, they're really good. So I looked them up, found out that they have a tour. Well, that wasn't quite true. They do raise their prices, but they, um, they are, uh, they have 200 employees. And um, just as an example of their level of engagement, and they, they, they intentionally practice servant leadership. Um, 200 employees on their own initiate 1,000 to 1,250 Kaizans or process improvement initiatives on their own, hmm. um, not driven by you know, the CEO, the CFO or whatever. Um, and each one saves the company about $1,000 a year Wow. which is the equivalent of four to five percent of gross sales each and every year hmm. and they're extracting that kind of waste out of their out of their system so they have enormous flexibility and pricing what to do with that extra value what to do with the extra money that it saves them um, and it means that they have people who don't quit mm -hmm. and they employees don't. feel valued because their feedback is being listened to and implemented on the spot Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, <laughs> and it's, in fact, when I was, I was sitting in my car one morning, eating my, my morning, drinking my morning latte, and I'm getting ready for my, my tour of the facility. And I'm watching people come and, you know, come into the door. I'm thinking, this is really strange. Everybody is smiling. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to come to work. <laughs> I know. It, mm -hmm. it, it, it was really, it was just, it was like, it was stunning. And I've walked mm -hmm. into the front door of a lot of organizations. I've never found one where people were always smiling, just walking mm -hmm. in. Nice. I bet that was a wonderful experience. <laughs> it was actually. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, kind of along that lines, and you know, you talked about empowering your staff and allowing them to make decisions and things. And sometimes, you know, that's a little bit hard to do. So yep. how did the organizations that you research, how did they actually implement that so they could empower their employees? Yeah, great question. Um, and, you know, we all talk about empowerment and got to empower people. And then most of us turn right around and take that power right back again. Mm. And um uh, what I found was uh, nothing that was hard, nothing that was complicated, uh, nothing that required a PhD in organizational design or, or advanced degrees in anything. It was very, very simple, yet and sometimes scary um, activities. So uh, I'll give you one example. Um, a friend of mine is the chief medical director of a large trauma uh, center, level one trauma center. And one of the first people I talked to actually uh, for the book, and uh, he said, you know, our former CEO never left our office. It was up on the 12th floor of the hospital. He said, I'm one of her senior leaders. I never saw her. The only communication I had with her was, you know, the occasional, you know, executive meeting and emails. Mm. He said, consequently, there was no trust of executive leadership. There was no reason to trust executive leadership. He said, we get a new CEO. The first thing he does is moves, move the office from the 12th floor to the first floor right behind the admitting center so he can get a sense of the pulse of the hospital. Mm -hmm. He said, he comes by my office at least twice a week. He visits me mm -hmm. and my team at least twice a week, sometimes three. He said, relationships are being formed. He said, the sense of empowerment and engagement with my staff is skyrocketing mm. just because the CEO walks in and says, hi, mm. that's yeah. one of the most common practices I found. Um, if, if an organization or a team leader wants to engage and empower their workforce, this is going to sound kind of crass, but get your bottom out of your chair and go visit your staff. Mm -hmm. you are giving them respect. Right. You are acknowledging what they do and the value that they do. And oh, by the way, don't forget to say thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so that, yeah, so that's one, one thing. The other thing um, that I found is, uh, and again, this goes uh, uh, right to the heart of the air of so much contemporary education about leadership, which is don't be a problem solver. Um, 
most of us be, become leaders based on our ability to solve problems. Mm -hmm. What I consistently found that organizations that intentionally empower their workforce and create really a, 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 a team of empowered, courageous, fearless employees is that they intentionally avoid being problem solvers. Mm. Um, one hospital that I, uh, I, I, uh, I spent quite a bit of time with, um, uh, the last eight or nine years straight, they have been, uh, recognized as one of the safest hospitals in America, um, consistently ranked in the top 5% of hospitals in America. Some have special, uh, speculated that they might even be one of the safest hospitals in the world. Hmm. They train their leaders, do not solve problems. Hmm. So if I'm, if hmm. I'm working for you and I have a problem um, and I come to you with my problem and you solve my problem for me, you've actually made two mistakes. Mm -hmm. One is I've had to come to you. Right. Your job, right. first mm -hmm. of all, is to come to me. Mm -hmm. Second thing, you can help me think about the breadth and the scope of that problem, but you are not to solve the problem for mm -hmm. me because when it does, you devalue my basic intelligence, my ability to solve a problem. I'm the frontline worker. You disrespect that position and, uh, and, and you disempower me. Mm -hmm. But if you help me solve the problem, not give me the solution, but you help me think right. through the problem, now you automatically force me to think mm -hmm. about, oh, I am a problem solver. I can mm -hmm. solve problems. I have the energy, the power, the intelligence, and the forethought to solve problems. Now you've just done two things really well. Mm -hmm. Not only have you increased my, 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 the value that I feel like I'm adding to my, my, custom, my, my company, but you've also helped me become a more self-confident human being. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and so you, you not only have, have, have made me a more valuable employee, You've helped me become a better, more self-confident, more self-empowered human being. Mm -hmm. So that, are, they, are they asking their employees, and let's say when this is happening and someone comes to them, are they saying like, okay, well, let's think through a couple of possibilities of a solution, you know, and then making them like say that, or do they have them go back? Like, instead of doing it right then, do they have them go back and say, okay, I want you to go back and think about it. And then why don't you come with me some, some ideas like, what are some examples maybe of what leaders are doing so their employees yeah. can come up with those solutions? Yeah. Well, the, the training for leaders is, would be to help a subordinate think through the scope of the problem, the breadth of the problem. So I think it'd be safe to say they would take that, you know, the, your, the, your first approach would be, mm -hmm. okay, let's think it through who else is going to be impacted by a solution. You know, let's think about some of the, uh, the, the, the possibilities for solutions. Who's going to be impacted? Uh, do we need to consult with them? Um, do, we need to, do we need to do some kind of a Kaizen or they're, they're a big a lean mm -hmm. organization? Do, should we do a, a lean workshop on this to, to think it through? Um, and, uh, you know, have you done the five whys? Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, so they use all of the tools, but ultimately, you know, it, it, you as my leader or manager, you're going to say, Dan, those, the, 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 the decision is yours. Mm, okay. So they and, really put the decision in, in the hands of the subordinate. And that's right. the ultimate empowerment. Well, and sometimes the employee might be scared, though, to make the wrong decision, too. So I think having a leader that knows they might make a mistake at some time, but they can help them learn, like, maybe what they did incorrectly, maybe, or a better yep. way to do something. So the next time, you know, they're even more confident, you know, yep, and then yep. they'll be able to do that better. <laughs> well, that, and that's, I, that particular hospital, I would, I would uh, put in the category of a deliberately developmental organization mm -hmm. where every leader understands that one of their key roles is right. to develop their workforce. And sometimes mm -hmm. that means making a mistake. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but that, that development is not just technical and professional mm -hmm. skills. It's also personal, uh, uh, you know, development as well. Um, and they're very big that, you know, on the idea that we don't just make better doctors and better nurses, better nurses and med techs, better men, med techs. We also want to create and develop better human beings. Mm -hmm. 
because ultimately that is value that is delivered to the patient. Right, right. Well, and earlier in the example that you were giving where, you know, the person was close to his people and he was interacting and went and talked to them. Um, and I know people are probably thinking that's like a great idea, but you don't know, like I have, you know, so many employees or now with mm -hmm. COVID and people working remote, it's harder to yep. connect. So what would you say in yep. those two examples? Either there's a lot of employees and it's hard maybe to connect with everyone and, or, you know, a lot of people now are having to work remotely. So you don't sure. see each other on sure. a daily basis. Yeah. Yeah. The, the remote thing, um, you know, with COVID, um, you know, hopefully that's coming somewhat to an end, mm -hmm. but yeah, that I think everybody's gonna, uh, is gonna have to figure out how do we, how do we can, how does leadership connect with the rank and file in a virtual world? Mm -hmm. um, I'm not convinced that we're all going to come back to mm -hmm. what was normal. <laughs> okay. It's going to be a new sense of normal, mm -hmm. but I think that's one of the key, the, the key challenges of, mm -hmm. of leadership in this new normal, whatever it's going to be. Mm -hmm. um, uh, on the other hand, I have heard people say, well, it's, I'm just too busy. I can't do this. I can't do that. I've got all these meetings. And frankly, um, to be honest, I think, I think it's, it's an excuse. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the things I, in, in the book, I start out with saying is uh, understanding leadership, especially servant leadership uh, in a systemic way might be terrorizing for some. Mm. And, and that's, and that's why, you know, one of the, uh, one of the people I interviewed uh, for the book as a guy, he, he's retired now, but he was the uh, CEO of a um, hospital in Miss Mississippi with like 5,000 employees. Wow. Um, no small organization. Mm -hmm. uh, the joke about John was if you need to see him, don't bother going to his office. Cause he's not there. Mm. Um, he would regularly eat lunch in the, one of the main cafeterias. They, they like five, I think they own five different hospitals. Um, he would regularly eat lunch in one of the cafeterias just so he can connect with, with the staff. He said, I could learn more in a half hour eating lunch with, with a group mm -hmm. of nurses than I ever could, you know, right. listening to an, in an executive management team or a meeting. Mm -hmm. um, and I found that consistently with organizations that are really performing at an exceptional level at some way, some form. Um, they, they understand that leadership does their best work when they're not sitting in their office. Right. Um, in fact, uh, the healthcare organization, um, that I mentioned a minute ago that teaches their leaders, don't be problem solvers. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, that particular hospital, I think it has 10 stories top, the top floor would be the natural place for the, for the executive suite. It has a, it would have a commanding view of a city water snow-capped mountains, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They put their executive offices in the basement mm. because they don't want their, 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 their CEO and their executives sitting in their office all day long. They want them out with the rank and file, interfacing mm -hmm. with them, working mm -hmm. with them, coaching and mentoring. And that includes the CEO. Mm -hmm. Again, it's important. So it's also showing that they don't feel that they're just above the regular yes. employees, you know, like yes. I feel the same way with my own staff. Like I don't want to be seen as just like that leader and it's like an unreachable person. I want to be seen as just part of the team, right? We're all yep. working together, right? That's right. how I right. feel about the company, you know, right. and right. the staff that's there. Um, and, you know, I think that's one example that just shows that they value their staff yep. and they're not yep. feeling that they're, yep. you know, yep. worthy of something better. Right. So. Well, the, the manufacturing company with 200 people that I, that I referenced, uh, one of the things I noticed when I walked in the door was there's no offices. Mm. And when I was talking with uh, one of their senior leaders later, he said, um, he said, you know, we recognize that a office for the CEO, the president of the company, um, is an expensive piece of real estate. Mm -hmm. Doesn't add a lot of value to the customer. Right. Adds a lot of value to the CEO or the president, makes mm -hmm. them feel good, adds no value to the customer and ultimately disempowers the, uh, the rank and file because when there's a problem, they have to go see the mm -hmm. president in his office and be immediately hit with that sense of I'm the boss and you're not. Right. If you want to talk to the president of the company, he's out on the manufacturing floor or the, or the design floor. 
mm -hmm. working working directly with um, with the rank and file. Right. Well, and I know when you were, you know, talking about empowering employees, letting them make decisions and things like that, you know, you that's one of the actual like how to's, you know, to actually mm -hmm. start implementing this. Um, but then are there other tips, you know, that can help somebody know, like, these are some of the things that you should do to be that leader that you want to be and have your staff feel empowered and engaged? Um, yeah, uh, you know, <laughs> It's again, it's, it's one of those things that sounds so simple and it is mm -hmm. reward them for risk. Mm -hmm. um, this manufacturing company, you know, they give everybody a uh, uh, personal time off uh, for doing a personal Kaizen uh, mm -hmm. that's, that's going to save the company a thousand bucks. And uh, they want that the process of Kaizen so embedded into the culture, the DNA of the organization and their people, that they give their people personal time off if the Kaizen is for the company mm -hmm. or for a personal Kaizen. They still give them paid time off. Um, I heard stories of uh, one guy who had uh, reorganized the inside of a sailboat mm -hmm. and, and got his PTO. Um, I heard a rather funny story, actually the guy who was, who was meeting with me, one of their senior leaders, he's probably almost might be 40 maybe um he told me I, I thought it was hilarious he said um, my wife was very pregnant and i thought i would do her the favor of reorganizing her kitchen pantry oh nice <laughs> <laughs> he said fortunately she didn't kill me but she was not happy <laughs> but i got my pto <laughs> <laughs> well he thought he was being helpful right yeah yeah <laughs> some but, people would have appreciated that some people you know they like their things their way but yeah i mean that's a good way to look at it though too like you said it's making them think of what they could be doing to make improvements right you know it, exactly and mm -hmm. and it's a it's simple they, they didn't get a lot i think it was like 30 minutes or an hour or something of, of pto but it was just that acknowledgement Mm -hmm. of um, you are valuable, your ideas are valuable. We, we want your ideas, we want your engagement. We expect it, we hope to get it. Um, and uh, the other thing that that organization did, which was really kind of odd, was um, they, they changed the names of, of leadership. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, in a manufacturing company, they, the, the, the traditional names of, you know, this is my lead or this is my manager, manufacturing lead, production lead, or whatever, um, everybody's a mentor. Mm. Oh, nice. Uh, I like that. In fact, uh, in the tour, I, I heard a woman tell a story, she, and she had not been with the company long. Um, she tell, told the story of, of um, her, her job was to take big pieces of foam core material and cut it into parts for furniture, because they made high-end custom furniture, um, uh, commercial furniture. And she said, she was telling us the story. She said, I was getting four parts out of this big piece of foam core material, but I realized if the size of that material was reconfigured just a little differently, I can get five parts out of that. Mm. So she says, I go to my, my mentor and I ask my mentor if it was a good idea, if she saw the same thing I was saying and how to do this Kaizen thing, because she hadn't been doing Kaizen. And so, and but every time she used the word mentor, she'd sort of go like this, mm -hmm. and, and 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 right next to her there was another woman standing there who was very quiet, didn't say a word. Finally, at the end of her story, I had to ask the you know the dumb obvious question. I said, uh, "Is this woman your your supervisor?" And she goes like this, <laughs> "I guess so, but we just call them mentors." Mm -hmm. um, but what struck me about that was. A, they had empowered the workforce to identify opportunities to eliminate waste. Mm -hmm. And to even take that a step further, they had um, taken uh, the traditional role of the leader manager as kind of a traffic cop mm -hmm. and made them a mentor to their subordinates, which meant, which, you know, the title means my job mm -hmm. is to support you as right. the frontline worker. It's mm -hmm. the ultimate empowerment. The, the funny thing is, and the reason I think so many of us are scared to death of, of empowering others is that we think power is a, is, a, is a known commodity with fixed borders. Right. And it's not. 
<laughs> when, when, when we empower others, we create more power. Mm-hmm. We don't lose any power of our own, right? but we create more power for the organization to perform. Mm-hmm. And that's a beautiful thing when you see it in action. Exactly. Well, I know a lot of businesses will say like they have like core values and things like that too. And of course, as individuals, we have values. So where do the values kind of play into that whole concept of servant leadership? Great question. First response is what I found in the research is that high impact organizations really, um, they shrink the importance of core values. They raise the importance of foundational behaviors because they recognize that behaviors, behavior, especially of their leadership, that the, those behaviors is the values modeled in a human, in a human sense. Mm-hmm. Um, when we see someone behave in a certain way, they're modeling values, might be their own values or somebody else's values, but they're modeling values. And so um, they shrink the number of core values. What I saw consistently were no more than one to five rather than mm-hmm. 10 to 15. Um, but then they expand the, the role and the importance of core behaviors. Mm-hmm. So um, uh, one of the healthcare organizations, the one I mentioned that, that it's down in Mississippi, um, they have, they have a set of core values and they're, you know, they're, public, everybody can look at them. But um, every leader, manager, clinic manager, et cetera, is evaluated by both subordinates, peers, and supervisors Hmm. based in part on their modeling of a set of foundational behaviors. Hmm. Things like giving your team credit for success, but you take the responsibility if there's a failure. Mm-hmm. And uh, and every leader and manager is is evaluated at least once a year, sometimes twice a year, mm-hmm. on on how well they model those kinds of behaviors, um, and uh, you know consequently, their the level of engagement for that particular organization um, was like in the ninety sixth percentile nationally. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Customer satisfaction was in the top 10% of all hospitals nationally. Um, ranked as one of the best places to work, um, like for three consecutive years. Uh, ranked as one of the most innovative healthcare organizations, like for five consecutive years. And uh, uh, and we wonder, okay, how did they do it? Well, it wasn't it wasn't complicated, right? Not necessarily simple, but it wasn't complicated. And in fact, when I asked uh, John, the, the retired CEO, I said, uh, and he was one, he, he uh, definitely spoke about servant leadership and, and how he designed a system of servant leadership. Um, I said, so how did your leadership team react when you were rolling this thing out? And he kind of laughed. He said, half of them got up and walked out. Mm. He said, I found out later that half of them were waiting for me to get up and walk out. <laughs> mm. <laughs> but nobody walked out. Their, mm-hmm. The value, the role, the quality of their leadership increased. And by the way, when they got looking for new leadership, new leaders to come in, um, as well as to grow within the organization, mm-hmm. now people knew if they were from within the organization, they knew what was expected. They knew the kind of culture that they were trying to create. It was obvious. And people from outside the organization, they, they could see the kind of culture that was being developed and they would say, I want to work there. Mm-hmm. And, right. and, and so the quality of, of their hires actually increased um, just by, by focusing on creating a culture and a system of servant leadership. Nice. So if someone's listening, you know, to this and they're saying, wow, that sounds like something I really want to implement, but I don't even know like exactly where to start. I've never thought about creating a system of leadership. You know, Mm -hmm. what would you tell them would be their first step? Uh, Well, I might say the first step is go to my website. I've got three special reports in the resource section. Um, They could download them at their, at their, at their leisure. Um, and I'm happy to give them away. And one is specifically on servant leadership, creating a system of, of servant leadership. The other one is, is um, you really need to start with the employee experience. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, um, this, 
might, might get into the weeds of what a system is a little bit, but a system always produces something. Mm -hmm. um, in your body and mine, there's 11 different systems running our bodies and each one produces something very, very specific. That's in support of the whole. Mm -hmm. A system of leadership that I found really begins with the, the employee experience. What, you know, if you and I are the, are the, are the let's say the co-CEOs of an organization, what's the experience that we want our employees to have on a daily basis? Mm -hmm. And um, when I asked, you know, the question, um, I heard things like love, mm -hmm. love and grace, relationship team, respect, um, collaboration. Mm -hmm. It was all very transcendent um, values, if you will, experiences when I'm, and I'm uncomfortable with that word. I don't think of transcendent and business kind of the same, kind mm -hmm. of like love. I don't think of love and business kind of in, the, in those same right. context, but yet that's what I found. Um, some branch of love, uh, loving employees, not a, not a squishy, wishy, sentimental emotion, mm -hmm. but an action. And, um, and you got to start there. Um, and I don't, I, there's no one, there's no one best answer to that. Um, mm -hmm. I, from, uh, you know, an organization, you know, high industrial, you know, manufacturing company, um, employee safety was a mm -hmm. huge issue. Um, right. And they focused on that. Um, on the other hand, uh, if you're Google and you're, and you're a team leader in Google, they're going to, they're going to focus on something called psychological safety, mm -hmm. um, two sides of the same coin, but each one reflects really the unique, um, characteristics of that particular organization. Right. This has been an interesting discussion. I know we're running out of time for today. Um, and I know you did mention if someone, you know, would like to go to your website, they can get, you know, some free resources you have. So yep. I would love for you, if there's anything else you want to share also that you have as resources, um, but then also tell the listeners how they can find you, whether again, your website or phone number, sure. any yep. way to reach you. Sure. Well, the website is always the best place to start. Okay. Um, also my phone number, I'll give you, give you my phone number. It's on the website too, but I'll give it to you. It's uh, 425-269-8854. And my policy is I will give anybody who wants to call and talk about leadership and culture um, a minimum of 30 minutes. And if they want to go an hour, that's fine too. Nice. After an hour, and we may have to talk about something else, but yes. <laughs> uh, I'll, uh, I'm, I'm happy to speak with them. I'm happy to, I do, um, I'm starting to do more and more uh, leadership events for organizations, um, uh, virtual. And uh, when we get out of this virtual um, environment, uh, hopefully, uh, you know, more in person where we spend maybe an hour or two and uh, really working through what is a, what is a leadership culture look like, how to design mm -hmm. culture. I use culture and leadership almost synonymously because they're two sides of the same coin. Mm -hmm. You can't have a good culture without good leadership. The result of good leadership is a great culture. Um, and so call me, uh, send me an email, um, look at my website. I've got, I've got a blog there. And I've got uh, special reports, one on servant leadership, one on uh, 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 creating a culture of, of a, fearless, a fearless organization. And the third one, I forget at the moment. <laughs> okay. um, so what is your website? Like Daniel, the address? Yep. Yeah, yeah, Daniel Eds, E-D-D-S dot com. Oh, okay. Just, very just, simple. Just mm -hmm. very just simple. Name dot com. <laughs> just my name dot com. Yep. Perfect. Yep. Well, I want to thank you, Daniel, for being a guest on my show today. And I want to also thank the listeners for tuning in. I hope you found this topic interesting and that it answered some questions about designing your system of servant leadership. If you have any additional questions or comments, be sure to reach out to Dan at any of the links that he shared, or you can reach out to us at media at abandp.com. And would you please share our show information with those you know? I'd really appreciate your support. I hope you can join us for next week's show, Failing Doesn't Make You a Failure. And please remember you can connect with us on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. And my website is www.abandp.com. And you can also find the links posted on iTunes, TuneIn, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and Spotify. Until next time, have a great week. Thank you for listening to This Help For You. Please join your host, Candy Messer, again next Tuesday. 
Have a terrific week.